Well, I'm joined here by Daryl Peel. He's the Extension Livestock Marketing Specialist for Oklahoma State University. Daryl, it's great having you back on. It's nice to be back here. Well, I think the big line item that we got to talk about today is the latest cattle on feed report, and that showed a that the May 1st inventory is now at 11.6 million head, and that's down 3.5% from last year. A little bit on the bearish side, like the last report, but still showing that bullish tech fundamentals that's smaller cattle herd. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, the report in general was pretty well anticipated, so I don't expect a, a major market reaction to it, although you never quite know. But, uh, um, you know, it does show that we are continuing to pull the cattle on feed inventory down. But I think to your point, probably a little bit slower maybe than we would have expected. And so placements were down, but not down all that much. Um, now we had one less business day last year, or the last uh, compared to a year ago uh, last month. So uh, that affects your interpretation a little bit. But uh, um, you know, in general, the report uh, doesn't change the story at all. But it also it shows that it's taking some time still uh, to sort of see these cattle numbers tighten up as we expect that they will here at some point. All right, and then you brought up those placement numbers, like you said down probably not as much as people are well, it was actually more than what was expected but still a little bit less than what we've had in the past but with that is it guys that are is that mean with less supplies coming in or is that just guys holding off because they see some good prices to try to feed out them calves before they're putting it on feedlots well i think it's probably a combination of things i suspect the feedlot demand for cattle for placements has been fairly strong so they've been trying to take advantage of the fact knowing that cattle prices are going up and are going to continue to go up so i think feedlots are trying to get their hands on as many cattle as they can the drought uh, conditions that we've had at least in the center part of the country may be playing into that a little bit and forcing some people to go ahead and move some cattle or at least encouraging them to think about uh, taking advantage of that so I, I think it's a combination of those things. Again, it it it, uh, it it doesn't really represent anything fundamentally different, and probably it it it's it's like a lot of other things we've had over the last several months. It probably means that we're pulling cattle forward a little bit by placing them now, but that means they won't be there later, and so uh, it it sort of sharpens the focus on tighter cattle supplies as we go forward. All right. So you said feedlot procurements are a little bit more aggressive. Are packers seeing the same thing, trying to get ahead of that? Well, I think, yeah, they, you know, everybody at the feedlot and, and the packing level recognizes that cattle numbers are going to get tighter um, and the costs are going up from the bottom up, right? So feeder cattle uh, costs are going up for the feedlots. Now, fed cattle markets have been, uh, you know, really helpful to them. And that's another reason why feedlots have been willing to place cattle, because in the short run, their margins have actually been pretty good. We've had record fed cattle prices. At some point in time, the feeder cattle are probably going to catch up, if you will, with the fed, fed cattle and start to squeeze that margin a little bit. Packers, uh, you know, again, um, you know, slaughter is going to continue to tighten up as we go forward. Uh, their margins are getting tighter. Uh, so, you know, they, they've, uh, you know, they, they've got lots of challenges going forward as well. And right now we're seeing a little bit of softness on the, the box beef market. Uh, that that's also squeezing them kind of from the top and the bottom. Now, kind of moving on to the feed situation, I really want to talk about that corn basis. It's still pretty strong down in cattle tr country, trying to pull those, trying to pull that supplies down there, limited forage availability. Uh, has there really been a struggle to, you know, secure those feed supplies just to make sure that there is enough for those feed lots? Because like you said, the feed lots are still aggressive, but is there kind of been a challenge on the feed feeding you know, feed supply side specifically? You know, I don't know if they've had a, a lot of severe challenge in actually acquiring the product that they need. It's more a question, I think, of the cost of it. Certainly the cost has been elevated uh, and that's been another part of the challenge they've dealt with over the last, uh, really the last couple of years, but it's just continued to, to ramp up a little bit. Um, and, and I suspect there has been some difficulty in, in acquiring product as well, at least having to pull it maybe from, from farther away. Um, you know, now one thing about it, uh, right now, the, the, the corn market prospects are, are looking fairly good from a feed perspective, um, maybe not from a corn farmer perspective, but from a feed perspective, uh, acreage appears to be up, planting is off to a good start. Uh, so, you know, we've got a long ways to go to have this crop in the bin, but uh, from a feed perspective, it looks like there's some decent prospects for some moderation in feed costs, at least as we get into the next crop year. 
All right, and so you brought it up before we started here, but Oklahoma is finally getting some widespread rains going on. And looking at that forage outlook, is that kind of an optimistic thing that guys are still trying to point towards because with El Nino coming, better prospects of rain down in that area? How is that looking specifically? You know, it's it's certainly very timely. We are getting uh, rains in some key areas that had missed out on pretty much everything up to this point. Uh, so it's going to help a lot. You know, we've already missed out on some forage production this year, both pasture and hay production, just because we're late. But uh, better late than never, I guess, is is the is the phrase here. Uh, the you know the the pastures will respond with some growth. This at least, um, I think, uh, for the areas that are getting rain, will will help to sort of stabilize numbers. I know it hasn't been, you know, two or three weeks ago, producers were telling me that if we didn't get rain, they were still looking at additional liquidation. And so I think we're, you know, I, I wouldn't say we've totally stopped it yet, but I think we're closer to sort of stabilizing that situation. It's going to take some time for enough, uh, you know, healing on those pastures that have been under a lot of stress and to regrow and, and to catch up on both pasture and hay supplies. So, uh, you know, I don't think we're gonna get real aggressive about trying to turn this into an expansion yet in that region, uh, or for that matter, in the whole country. But, uh, but this is certainly the first step. And, uh, and again, as you said, with the expectations that El Nino is going to move us generally to more favorable moisture and, and uh, forage conditions as we go through the year, I think it, it gives us increased uh, uh, likelihood that we're setting the stage for a much better situation next year, even if we're a little bit late to really help things out as much as we'd like this year. Brought up, you know, that expansion period, we're seeing record low cattle numbers or cow, beef cow numbers specifically, and already the low forage availability uh, uh, challenges right now. But also, what what's different this year that might also challenge uh, expansion? I know we got higher interest rates, but kind of what what kind of sets the stage different right now for that expansion period? Uh, well, you know, you raise a good point because, I mean, the, the first part of it is just uh, Mother Nature, first of all, taking care of the drought in some key areas, um, you know, where a lot of beef cattle reside. And so we've got to sort of fix the drought in the central and southern plains before I think you can really turn the national picture around. The other thing is, you know, we're coming out of a year where we had extremely high input costs, and they're still high for most people, although fertilizer and, and some uh, chemical costs have moderated a bit. Uh, in some regions, but uh, I think producers are are you know certainly they're 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 monitoring the the higher cattle prices and the trends that we're seeing. I think they're they're getting more excited about that, but they're also moving with a fair degree of caution. Uh, the other side of it, if you just look at the total numbers, is that uh, we're really limited on what we can do in the short run. If the drought suddenly went away tomorrow and forage availability wasn't a question, we still couldn't put together any significant expansion in 2023. In fact, I think we'll see some net liquidation. We simply didn't bring enough replacement heifers into this year uh, that are that are going to calve this year or are calving this year. Um, and you know, with cow slaughter is down so far, beef cow slaughter, but it's not down as much as it would be if we didn't have the drought. And so the combination of those things probably says we see some net liquidation yet in 2023. Um, and maybe we set the stage to see a very, uh, you know, modest level of potential expansion going into 2024. But that's going to be contingent on how these forage conditions go through the year. And looking at that future outlook, uh, exports, beef exports have been a little bit disappointing right now compared to 2022. However, that seems more like a supply issue than a demand issue internationally, or at least the USDA th seems to think so with some of their estimates. Would you agree? I do. I think that's really the issue. Uh, we, you know, we've sort of anticipated that we would certainly not top last year's record beef exports uh, in 2023. Um, you know, and, and it's for, you know, several reasons. Uh, first and foremost, beef production is falling, so we're not going to have less beef. That means that it's likely going to be more expensive. Uh, for both domestic and international customers of beef. Uh, and when you combine that with the fact that we've generally had a pretty strong dollar uh, over, over the last uh, several months, uh, which further makes our product more expensive to foreign customers, I think the combination of all of those, uh, it, it's very uh, realistic to expect that we're going to see beef exports drop back a little bit. But at the same time, it doesn't really imply any real weakness in demand. I think it's just it's just the market doing what it does as prices change and as supplies change. 
uh, we're just not going to export as much, but it's not for lack of fundamental demand. All right. I know we're in a bull market right now, but we've been talking a little bit about, you know, kind of not good news. Is there anything you are optimistic about with the cattle industry moving forward as we think more about moving into the summer, trying to get some better uh, production going on here and better rain outlooks? What are you looking at? <laughs> well, you know, we, we certainly have some production challenges in these regions in the center part of the country that have most of the severe drought that does remain, but we, we are seeing that change, so I'm optimistic that that's beginning to happen. Um, uh, you know, obviously prices have been trending higher for quite a few months now, and they're going to go a lot higher before this is over. Uh, you know, once we get to the point where the industry really can see for sure in total that expansion is a possibility, then we're going to we're going to retain a lot of heifers. And when we do that, we you know, we already have small numbers. And when we retain a lot of heifers, we're going to really squeeze available feeder supplies. I think that probably really starts this fall uh, and goes into next year primarily. And so uh, so there's you know, there's going to be a, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of higher prices, a lot of chance for producers that have cattle to uh, participate in that. Now, the one caution is producers that are down in numbers because of the drought or, or you know, whatever, uh, are going to face some real challenges trying to rebuild during that process. Uh, obviously, breeding stock, heifer, and, and breeding cow values are, gonna, are going to accelerate significantly. They're starting to go up now, but uh, it'll really kick off here in a few months, I think. And so that's going to be an additional cost challenge for those producers. All right. Well, like you said, a lot, a lot to look forward to, a lot to you know, be cautious about, but still with 2023 into 2024, 24, prices seem like a really good outlook for guys moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, you know, the opportunities there, it will be a very volatile market or a very dynamic market. Uh, that's opportunities, but it also means that producers need to, you know, kind of pay attention to what's happening and, and be as nimble as possible to take advantage of those opportunities. For sure. And again, that's Daryl Peel with Oklahoma State University. Thanks again. Great talking to you as always. You bet. Happy to do it.